So for this lecture, we're going to be covering presidential image. Um, really, we're going to be talking about evolution of the press and how that intersects with presidential management of their image. So starting off um, at our founding, we are really um, have a, a unique um, media environment. We would call them partisan presses, and this occurs from the late 18th through the early 19th century. And at the founding, the press was really very different from what we see today. Um, the press was more like an arm of political parties. Um, they often were able to run because political parties purchased contracts with them. Um, so media at the time like fell into two camps. If it was aligned with the party of the president, uh, then, the, then they were sort of praised, then the president was praised. If it was from an opposing party or a faction, uh, then they were really demonized and critiqued. Um, and oftentimes they had some pretty blatant personal and partisan attacks uh, in, in this era. Now, from the mid 19th century onward, we really have the rise of the national news. So as before, in that previous era, a lot of that was more localized news. But here we're starting to see what occurs in like Louisiana um, is covered in uh, New York and what occurs in New York is covered in DC, right? So it's um, the president is having to sort of put out a consistent national message. Um, this is also compounded by the fact of the penny press, the rise of the penny press at this time. Um, is starting then, presses begin to rely more on advertisements and marketing for revenue. And penny presses are also, um, because of this, uh, quite a bit cheaper. Um, they make newspapers and um, content uh, much less expensive and therefore more people are reading. There's just a much broader audience of people reading the news. And with that, with that broader audience, they don't necessarily want to pursue those partisan messages because it wouldn't necessarily appeal to the masses. Now, this works really well in Theodore Roosevelt's favor um, when he becomes president because the media, um, that penny press, they are wanting to churn out new content pretty consistently. And Roosevelt, at the same time, has this new agenda that he wants to push with the public. Um, and so he develops this positive, chummy relationship with the press so that they can consistently put out new material and Roosevelt can advance his agenda in a public way. And this works well for both Roosevelt and the presses. Um, but this doesn't necessarily work well for all presidents, right? This might be unique to Roosevelt specifically. Things change again with the rise of the radio. Um, now they can speak presidents can speak directly to the American people as opposed to through journalists and the media. But they had to change their sort of long-winded speeches to shorter, more pithy talking points so that the American people can understand what they're proposing. Um, FDR at the time also knows that families are listening at home and he takes advantage of that feeling of intimacy. Um, but he is also really cautious to only use this tool sometimes. You want it to have an effect, right? You want it to be able to move people's opinions um, and it has a greater effect if you use it less. So I've also included this FDR video in our um, uh, video lecture folder and you can watch it if you'd like. Now, um, things get, change a little bit uh, when we have television. Um, we, as an audience, as the electorate, tend to put a premium on images now. So the messages still remain pithy and short like they did in the era of radio. Um, but for the most part, presidents need to look good and sound good on television. Okay, And television is really the way that most people, even today, people with lower levels of education and lower levels of resources, get their political news is through television. But I would, I would be cautious and, and tell you one thing that there, because of this, only some kinds of presidents are able to thrive in this era. We've had many previous presidents before 1950 who wouldn't have necessarily looked good or sounded good on the television. Um, some presidents who were in fact good presidents uh, wouldn't have been good on screen and it wouldn't have been good to hear them. They were in fact quite awkward and they would not have done well in today's sort of televised environment. 
Now, it's funny because Nixon is considered to be both terrible on television because of his performance in that 1960 debate with JFK. Um, but when he was actually president, he was considered very masterful of television and media. Um, he had a really, really sophisticated public relations team that was able to push out when positive events and trips happened. Even his silent majority speech, which um, we're going to watch a little bit of here, uh, was quite convincing to the public. And in many cases, he was able to lead opinion bef uh, in many ways before Watergate. I'm going to watch a little bit here, though. The fate of Lyndon Johnson did haunt Richard Nixon. He felt he had to demonstrate that most Americans still supported him and that it would not benefit Hanoi to stall peace negotiations. Don't get rattled. Don't waver. Don't react, he told himself as he went to work on a speech to respond to the protests. Insisting on writing it himself, he distinguished his supporters, the forgotten Americans, from the vocal minority in the streets with a new catchphrase. To you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. For the more divided we are at home, the less likely the enemy is to negotiate at Paris. Let us be united for peace. Let us also be united against defeat. Because let us understand, North Vietnam cannot defeat or humiliate the United States. Only Americans can do that. It was the most effective speech of Nixon's presidency. 80,000 telegrams and letters arrived at the White House. Nearly all supported him. His approval rating soared. We tend to forget this, right, about Nixon. Instead, we oftentimes focus on his gaffes, as particularly Watergate, but he was considered quite effective in terms of media and press and image management. Uh, Reagan is obviously also quite sophisticated. He was an actor, so of course. Um, he had really sharp, concise speeches that spoke really well to people. And um, so this is the Mr. Gorbachev uh, tear down this wall. And now, again. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I think we're all somewhat familiar with that speech. Um, but the point here is that Reagan obviously is super, super skilled uh, with, with the press. Um, he was really careful to keep the media at arm's length. Like, it's unlike Teddy Roosevelt's relationship, that sort of chummy one. Instead, Reagan keeps the press at a distance. So when he visited China, the press could take pictures but not ask questions. This means that there's not a lot of discussion about policy, and it's obviously more about image. Um, but Reagan, even when it was about policy, he tended to stay on message. Um, it, his team tended to stay on message so that they really highlighted the policy or topic that they wanted to. And he was very, very successful in this. Of course, things are a little bit different now with the internet, um, particularly when it comes to scandals or even unfounded allegations. So previously, Dukakis got into what was seemingly a, a controversy that he had mental health issues, and Dan Quayle was caught up in a scandal over his National Guard service, a potential affair he might have had, and also his academic record. These attacks were largely unfounded, but with attack journalism, they gained traction really quickly. And as your reading puts it, it's a rumor that had simmered at the edge of public consciousness, right? Now, with the internet, this attack journalism is now in the hands of every internet user. 
these rumors come about really quickly and they're really, really hard to undo. Think about Pizzagate, for instance. So now the internet puts presidents in a position where they can't control the information environment as much. Once a rumor that has simmered at the edge of public consciousness is on the internet, it's really difficult to undo, like and scrub the internet entirely of that rumor. Um, in this case, I wouldn't necessarily see Reagan succeeding here. Um, he can't carefully craft his media presence in the same way, particularly since the internet is so fragmented, right? Like in the case of Reagan, you're talking about a few networks, a few newspapers coming to events, whereas now think about the fragmentation of media on the internet. Instead, this really puts presidents in a more antagonistic position with the media and also the president just ultimately has a lot less control than they once did. So what we covered today is evolution of the press and how presidents can or really can't manage their image, uh, particularly in the last 50 years. So I will see you all in the next video lecture.